Okay, I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order. And uh, I have the agenda up on another part of my screen. Be patient, I'm using a smaller screen today. Um, first item of business is the meeting minutes uh, to review and hopefully vote to approve the meeting minutes from June 30th of 2021. Fred, do you have any comments or? The only comment I have is in the section that I, where I brought up the uh, Waitley, the arm being named for Waitley, Webbs has one B, not two. Oh, the name. man, okay. Got it. Um, well, I would hear a motion on that then. I will move we approve the minutes of the meeting. I'll second that. Uh, we need a roll call vote. Uh, so all those in favor, Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. And Jonathan's not here yet. So uh, we can move on. Um, the vendor payroll and warrants. Um, I did not have any comments on those. I was not the person to sign them though. Um, I had no comments when I looked at them. Okay, then I think we can uh, dispense with item two. Uh, now it's public comment. This is the time for uh, comments from members of the public uh, on items that are, sorry, uh, on uh, topics that are not listed on the agenda for today. So do I have anyone here who would like to give some public comment? on things that are not on our agenda tonight. Looking around, there's uh, a few people whose faces I can't see. I assume maybe they're on phones or don't have cameras. So do speak up. Um, okay, I feel like I've given sufficient time for people to speak up if they would like to. Um, so I think we're done with public comment. Um, all right, so we have one scheduled appointment, uh, and that would be Julie from Green Jeans Farms would like to hold a preliminary discussion about a proposed marijuana cultivation facility at 149 Christian Lane. Um, so maybe I can let, uh, let Julie speak for a few minutes and tell us what you're thinking of doing. Great, thank you so much. I'm Julie Boschman. I'm a general manager with Green Jeans Farms, LLC. Uh, thank you very much to the board members for hearing me tonight. Um, so I'm here to talk about a proposed cultivation site at 149 Christian Lane, which is Long Plain Farm. Um, Green Jeans Farms is a craft marijuana cooperative, which I don't believe you've seen in Waitley before, but it is a cooperative, just like you may have heard of before, it's managed by myself and my family members. We have various experience in farming, construction, and business, um, but we function like any other cooperative where we can't have any outside controlling interests and all the members have to be Massachusetts residents. And so we started this cooperative with the mission of giving Western Mass farmers uh, the opportunity to participate in the cannabis industry with their existing land and infrastructure. And so that's what we're doing at Long Plain Farm. Um, the cultivation site is, uh, we'll be utilizing existing greenhouses and all sun grown, so no artificial light planned. Um, and this project actually was previously approved by the zoning and planning boards in 2018. And I believe a host community agreement was executed with a separate group called Urban Grown um, that group is no longer involved with this site. Um, to my knowledge, there were no site control documents executed. The permits were never recorded with the registry and um, the provisional license has lapsed. So um, we're hoping to bring this project back to life as a local family and farmer owned organization. And I believe that lends much better to uh, the agricultural character of Waitley. So I'm happy to take um, any questions about that or the site. Yes, I have a question, uh, Fred Orlowski, one of the neighbors, abutters. 
Uh, hi, Julie. I think I remember seeing you before other, hey, um, other uh, activities. Uh, yeah. Hi, Fred. Hi. Uh, what experience do you have in, in, in this field of, of growing uh, and what alterations are going to be made to existing greenhouses that are there today? Yeah, great question. So I would say um, my experience mostly lies in project management. So um, I can really do all the planning up front. Um, I'm just finishing business school and it's an industry where I've you know, been networking and involved in for the last seven months. Um, my brother-in-law is a hemp farmer and a mushroom farmer in Paxton, Mass. And he's also a construction foreman. Um, and then I have other family members who are involved in finance and so I think we can really come together to, you know, have a great team and a great site. Um, and then as far as the, the site plans, so there are five existing greenhouses, which we plan to utilize for the plants. We, we plan to add one greenhouse, um, thir about 3,600 feet. And then we will also need to add a metal barn that kind of conforms with the um, agricultural feel of this on the road. Um, and that'll be for warehouse uh, storage, like a head house. So um, processing, drying, and storing. Okay, what's your schedule for doing all this? Well, I would love to be able to submit our state application in September, um, which is why I've been bothering Brian to get this host community agreement um, process kicked off. and. Um, would love to meet with other department heads um, or whatever the board feels uh, before the actual permit applications. Brian, can you sort of run through again what the permit requirements are and what boards whatever need in the town need to sign off? Yep. So I'm also going to share the site plan if that's okay. Yeah. I don't for those who haven't have not seen it. Um, so typically, uh, wait, we need a host community agreement, which is um, executed by the select board. Um, then it's then there's a uh, special permit required from the ZBA and site plan approval from the planning board. Um, obviously, if there's any wetlands that are impacted, it would it it would trigger uh, review by the conservation commission. Um, and then obviously the, the, the state licensing from the CCC. So I believe those are, those are the licenses that would be required or may be required in, in respect to the conservation commission. Is there a standard order in which those would be obtained? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yes and no. Um, the zoning bylaws require, my interpretation require the submission of a draft host community agreement um, as part of the special permit application. I think in practice, the ZBA has, has, has looked for um, executed host community agreements. So a lot, of, a lot of previous applicants have gone to the select board first, uh, received their host community agreements, and then went through the, the land use permitting process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Joy, which ones are which ones are new here on the site plan? Can you? The yep. metal barn is new, and then is it this greenhouse? That's correct. So it's the lighter blue color. So the metal barn in the front, uh, which is right behind an existing farm that's pretty tall, and then the thirty six hundred uh, pose square foot greenhouse in the back, right. And the road is down here. Yeah. So how close are you to the school on the north side? We're within the 500 foot boundary. So where that fence line is at the top to the north is the 500 foot setback from the school property line.
I mean, at this point, does does anyone else have a question they want to ask? I had one small question. I like to think I know how to read a map, but um, it looks like one of those new greenhouses, the new greenhouse number six, is on some either it's either on a hill or it's on a over a hole. Yeah. Um, and there's a place where it says riprap, which I guess is just rocky. Is mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's uh, in some ways it's not my business, but I'm just curious. Um, that's is that a, a hill or a hole and what's the plan that you have to do in order to be able to build a greenhouse there yeah that's a great question so that's a swale um, that the landowner had dug uh, some years ago in order to help drain the field to the north and so mm. actually had that looked at by a wetland scientist ward smith he's with wendell wetland services um, mm out and looked at it just to check to make sure it is not a wetland and we do have a certification letter from him that it is not so um okay. if drainage issues our engineer can address it at the planning board okay yeah i think that is the better place they know more about drainage than say i would i was just curious because yeah. it was like a clear thing on your plan i don't know about it either i just thought it was a hole and i wanted to make sure it wasn't a wetland <laughs> Okay. So this dotted line around the outside, I assume well, that's the property line, which is going to be what fenced in. Correct. So and where's where's the access going to be in the southern part? Like it, I guess, exists today. Yes. So right now there's a existing dirt road that goes in, and you can see it kind of outlined there at the bottom. And so we'll come in on the right side. Okay. Okay. Um, do I have any any other folks um, wanting to ask questions at this point or make uh, whatever kind of comments you like about the whole? Can we ask a, can we ask a question here uh, from Jenny's house? Uh, Jenny, go right ahead. Uh, this is Beth Lucan um, asking the question. I'm wondering okay, whether thanks. you say there's not going to be additional lighting outside this facility. Is that what I understand? That's right. And no other kind of security? There will be cameras on the exterior and inside the greenhouses. Mm -hmm. And okay. any sense of how high or what kind of fencing you would be putting around this? Yeah, we would like to put, or I would like to put a, a stockade cedar fence just to conceal, you know, the greenhouses and, you know, make sure it fits in with the, the local character. And um, I think that's the, the most secure way. I think a chain link fence is easier to climb and doesn't look as good. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of people on Mitkowski Circle who have uh, concerns and questions about this whole idea. So I'm wondering if there's going to be an opportunity for us to weigh in at all. Yeah, absolutely. So we have to uh, hold a community meeting as far as uh, requirements for our state application. And then separately, I can provide my contact information. I'm out there all the time. So I'd be happy to meet with Butters informally as well. Yeah, OK. It, it, it just kind of took us a surprise. By surprise. OK. I thought this project had been through a, um, I don't know if if you're new to the neighborhood, but I thought it had been through the community meeting and all the, the permitting meetings before. Perhaps when it was um, suggested in 2018 or they went through part of the process, but certainly not since either of us have lived here uh, since 2019 that we're aware of. I think this proposal is a little different than the earlier one. Some of the, the newer buildings are different location. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So is your proposal, is it fully developed so we could look at all the detail or are you still working on that for these other committees? We're still working on that um, ahead of the planning board meeting. 
because I, I assumed that we'd have to have an executed agreement, uh, a host community agreement before we got to that stage. So, so just to talk a little bit about about process and in, in, in the board's past practices, and then the, the the board can decide what what the practices they want to do. Um, so, for for the previous agreements, the board has asked that the community outreach meeting happen um, prior to the board's meeting to discuss um, the host community agreement. Um, so, typically, the community outreach meeting happens. And then in the past, the board has designated one member uh, along with myself to uh, discuss the, the terms of the host community agreement. And then we would go back to a subsequent select board meeting and we would discuss um, the recommendation uh, from that select board member uh, to the rest of the board in terms of the, the host community agreement. Um, so I guess my question to the board is, is that the same practice that we want to implement and then who would be the lucky member that gets to uh, uh, negotiate. And Jonathan's not here, so you can stick him with it. <laughs> That's um, the other practice of the board. The person who's not here gets stuck with everything. No. So so why don't we go with past practice? <laughs> I, I don't Actually, Joyce has I been don't. the one that negotiates usually. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't see any need to depart from past practice. Um, so uh, unless Fred is really itching to negotiate a host community agreement. Um, uh, not particularly, no. Oh, okay. come on. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm, I'm fine with that. And uh, I completely agree with everything Brian said about the order things have, have happened. And because we like to hear um, feedback from the neighbors and what uh, uh, especially abutters and people in town think of it. Um, uh, maybe um, um, with the way the screen is, I don't see everybody at once. So I'm kind of looking yeah, stop this. through. Oh, thanks. Yep. Um, and I'm wondering if um, any of the people here uh, want to make uh, any further comments. I know we heard a little bit from uh, the box named Jenny, but has other people besides Jenny there. Um, there's Chris, there's Teresa Jones and Teresa Belial. Um, would anybody else like to put some comments in the record, even though today we're not making a decision, but we, we just welcome the feedback from people. I see George Ann, uh, Jim, uh, someone who does not look like his his name is Karen, but has Karen as the name on his screen. Um, okay. yeah, well, my wife's, uh, Teresa Jones is actually DeWitt Thompson. I'm using my wife's <laughs> computer here, but I don't have any comment. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, it sounds like we, um, we could probably move on. Julie, if you're, uh, if you're, understanding our past practice, then we we'll see you at a future select board meeting. Um, I don't think it's too let, all that far off in the future. And you'll get your um, community outreach meeting going in the meantime. Okay, so just to clarify, we should hold the um, community meeting first and then come back to the select board. And Brian, is there someone I should coordinate with on the um, notice? Uh, for the community outreach meeting yeah um so you provide notice as it's listed in the in the regulations um and that sh that should be fine okay um and obviously you can send a copy to the board to me and i'll, I'll get it out to them okay sounds sounds like a plan okay well great well thank you very much for coming to see us julie thank you julie Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good night. You too. Thanks. Can I ask one more que question? This is Beth Lucan. Oh, sure, Beth. Go right ahead. Um, how are the abutters going to be informed that this meeting is happening? Because it wasn't very well communicated 
No, unless people go on the website mm. and check meeting minutes, we don't know what's going on. Oh, well, I suppose one way is to go online and check meeting minutes, but I think the law <laughs> requires that they advertise, uh, what is it, Brian, 10 days in advance in the newspaper. But my guess is if you put in a good word to Brian, he will let you know when they inform him. Um, that would be one. I, that's what I would do. I would impose on Brian to shoot me an email. Um, and I, I'm guessing he would do the same for you. I would certainly think your butters uh, have a vested interest and certainly an right. interest at any rate in how the, what happened here. Oh, oh, absolutely. And um, I think that that's why the law requires notification, but they do not just notify the abutters in this case, notify the whole community. Okay, thank you. Right, and, and, and just, to, just to clarify, there's, there's really three, assuming they don't need conservation commission approval, there's really three different permissions that they need. One is the host community agreement with the select board, which states the, the responsibilities and financial terms between the two parties. Um, the next one is a special permit from the zoning board of appeals, and that has its own notification uh, requirements in terms of notification to abutters um, and public hearings will be held for that. And then the third permission they need is, is site plan approval from the planning board. And there's also notification and public hearing for that as well. Um, so this is really just their first preliminary meeting um, to introduce the project to the town. Um, so there'll be lots of other opportunities for, uh, for feedback and input. Great, thank you. Okay, is there um, anybody else wanna ask a question or put in some comments before we move to the next item? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, so let's go on to our old business. Um, old business part A, to discuss the water merger project and possible financial assistance to income qualified customers. So I'm not sure who to toss can, this to. I can first. start. I, I can lay the background. Um, and, and of course, uh, Jonathan's still caught up in the other meeting, and he's been a, a big advocate of this. <laughs> um, yeah. so that's an well, for, that's unfortunate. Um, so I guess I. There was so, so I think his interest, and I'll I'll try to speak for him because he's not here. Um, his interest was providing an opportunity for um, persons who are going to be uh, moving from the water uh, district to the water department that certain income eligible people um, would have an opportunity for financial assistance. Um, to help pay the $5,000 hookup fee. Um, and I guess I, I think the request from the board at the last meeting was that um, they would love to have a conversation with the water commissioners about that. Um, and so here we are. Well, I'll speak on behalf of that. Um, first of all, the water department is, um, definitely in favor of a payment fee. But our job is to provide safe drinking water to our customers. We don't have the knowledge to act as a bank or a loan company. And I see that you have provided some basic paperwork, um, which would assist these people who need financial help. And we don't have a problem with that because actually we do need the money up front as opposed to waiting for it. And the other thing, I think there's something that really hasn't look, been looked at is um, the district has been preparing for this for years for either a new system or a hookup to our water department. And they have had more than ample time to work out their financial problems. Back in 1986 or 84, um, this valley down here was hit with a disaster, poisoned water, 
um, we had to come up with the well thirty five hundred dollars at that time, and everybody was scrambling for hookup fees. I guess at the time, and I don't know, I wasn't on the board then that um, some bank had evidently had stepped forward to help people that needed it. But um, given the fact that their water district has more than ample opportunity and you are now giving them another opportunity, I think we're satisfied with that. Okay. I think one thing that we need to remember, and I support everything that Georgian has, has said, they've had several years to prepare for this. Uh, the other thing that it seems we keep forgetting is the water district has assets. They're a corporation or company or whatever. They have assets they, they, that come from their, what, 40 users of the system. Why can't their assets be used to fund the people that are having difficulty coming up with the 5,000 payment? They have money that, that could be used to do that. It's money their, their users have paid into their system. And, and if they can't afford to join the, the water department, why aren't they considering using some of their assets to help their people to join? Instead, you're looking at an outside process to do that and, and not even considering the, the assets of the water district. And I guess this information was brought out. Uh, I was on a committee to look at the, the water department merger, I don't know, two, three years ago when we first started. There was assets that were presented by the water district to the committee. Uh, assets in terms of money in the bank, uh, values of property and other things that they have. Uh, I don't see any discussion of what's happening with that now, other than after the merger is completed, it was my understanding that them, that assets would be distributed to the former uh, water district members. So none of that would come back to the town. It would go back to the members after the district was dissolved, which could take a few years to do. Uh, why isn't that being discussed? Okay. In, in looking, I didn't see anything in the proposal that said anything about how this was being funded yet. This, I saw an application form and a an intent to try to provide financial help for people who need it. Uh, but yes, there was a quite, essentially we will be putting ourselves in a position of providing interest-free loans to people with lower incomes. And the question is where that money comes from. Does it come from the town or does it come from the district? The money for those loans. Because the money, ultimately the people will pay the full amount of the, the $5,000 fee. I'm the new commissioner, John Logan, but is I'm still wondering how many people, if any, have financial duress to get onto the system, to get connected to the, to the town's water system. Have people come forward saying, I need help, I can't afford the 5,000? Mm, well, John would be a good person to ask that question of. I've had, I, I can speak for, for my own experience and I've had um, two people uh, who, who have inquired or, or who have checked in about whether there would be any financial assistance. I don't know if they qualify or not, but. Mm -hmm. okay. How are we going to treat uh, other, other people that are not part of the water district today? There's other, other people that are that are joining the water department, paying the fees. How are we going to treat them if they find out? Well, some people are, are we're financing their their hookup fees. So, should we do that for other people in town that are that are also hooking up to the water department? How are we going to treat them? 
so so there are there are questions to to be answered and, and that's one of them um and the other question that 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 fred talked about was was how do we fund this um so in one of the you know an idea with that is some of the uh covert relief monies that would be coming to the town um it's an eligible activity for um household it's probably eligible on two fronts in terms of household assistance um, to income qualified residents and also um, under the category to invest in uh, water infrastructure in, in terms of in terms of whether this whether this idea is even adopted by the board and to what extent um, is it limited to um, you know people that uh, switching over from the district or is it, is it, is it going is it is it extended is really a policy discussion um, and that's that's going to be within the purview of the of the select board, I would imagine, to decide that. Because um, at this Ryan, point, it, is it within the purview of the select board to authorize interest-free loans to residents, or is that something that would have to go to a special town meeting? Um, I believe it's within the authority of the select board um, to create programs that uh, would be funded with funds that don't require an appropriation. A further appropriation. So grant funding would be one of those. How does this apply in the future? Um, another person comes in and they want to hook up, say two years from now. Yep. So, okay. so that's a policy question as, as to the, the, the scope and, and length of any sort of program that the town implements. Uh, the town has had similar programs like this in the past there's a um there's a i think there's still a housing rehab program that that's dormant there's there's a septic revolving uh program that is really gone has really gone dormant um so it, it's kind of like a it, it's essentially set up as sort of a revolving fund where the where the where the money's loaned out and then it's paid back um and the idea as, as it would be is that there would be income qualifications um so people would have to prove a financial hardship. Um, yeah, I get the sense that we're not talking about a lot of people when we're talking about the water merger. And we're certainly, I mean, that's a lot of people joining the system. I don't think in any given year, we have anywhere near that many people joining the system. So if we were to establish a revolving fund, excuse me, it would be that heavily, especially if it has the um, income um, have a, I, mean, I would not be opposed to establish doesn't affect um, our local taxes, if it helps people get clean water. Joyce, you're breaking up. We didn't, I don't know if we heard everything you were saying. Joyce, you're muted now. You're muted. There we go. It, yeah, it muted me when it, uh, when it kicked me out. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. We didn't hear you for the last probably. Minute. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think I would not be opposed to using some grant funding to establish a fund that helps people get on the town water supply, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're from the the uh, the older dis. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to use district and system incorrectly, but we've got 40 new people. Right, and that's from the water district. Okay, <laughs> um, whether they're from the district or whether they're from outside the district, and they're just trying to get drinking water from the town. I think having a fund that people can apply to on an income eligible basis is not a bad thing to have, regardless. So, um, if we have that opportunity, let's take it. We set up the revolving fund and uh, it's there for, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge revolving fund, right? 
because we're talking about probably a couple of hookups a year and then that money gets paid back. So I, I, I guess um, I don't feel like it's gonna be over, um, I don't know, it's not gonna be overextended. And we can say this is, you know, as funds are available, um, if you know, we can word it so that because it's grant funding, we don't guarantee this um, must be as funds are available. But I think we could fund it so that, you know, two or three hookups a year are, are fundable and let it go from there. I, I would agree, especially since right now is a perfect time because we do have the COVID money, which will fall into the proper, you know, the, this program would fall into the categories that it funds, mm. that it just happens we're in, in a perfect time to do it from that source. I'd like to offer one word of caution, if I could, from the water angle, is we always are willing and wanting to help people with public water systems. But what happens if somebody up in the hill says, you know, I need to drill a new well, I can't afford it. Can you help me out, you know, with your fund? So we think it through as what it's a great idea to help people who, who need the help. It's, it's wonderful, but it's not just about the public water system. You know, as, as the commissioners, we're going to be looking mm -hmm. and quite closely at, you know, how do we structure the system fee wise mm -hmm. and management wise to make sure there is water available. You know, we might run to capacity if you keep hooking people on and, uh, more and more and more, and then where do you find another source? And that gets into megabucks to find other sources. So uh, anyway, just want to throw that out there because there are people on private wells right. who, who may need a new well and say, I need I need some help too. Well, yeah, the, hmm. the difference with that would be that this is a mandate that people on the system are being told you must pay this, whereas people on private wells do not have necessarily a mandate. Right. They want water. <laughs> I'm sorry, the price of drilling a well is similar to the price of going onto the system. But, but I'm, I'm talking legally, off. there is no legal mandate that the, ta the town is issuing a legal mandate through the water department here that says you must pay this $5,000 to hook up. There is no similar comparable mandate with regard to a private, to someone who's not on the system. Therefore, there's no mm -hmm. recourse from someone to say, help me with my well, because there's been no yeah. governmental action to force that. Right. Well, yeah, I, I think legally you're probably right about that. But um, I kind of hear what John is saying that if the issue is really, we want people in our town to access to uh, clean water, could we, could we make that you know, a little bit bigger? We're not talking about 50 wells a year needing to be drilled. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about pretty small numbers. So if we were to um, expand that, I mean, we, we, we're not gonna decide at this meeting, but I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to putting some of our COVID money towards a, a bigger fund that would help everyone in the town, including those who are having to drill their own wells. Because that is a, is a big expense when it comes up. And we want everybody to have this, to have clean water. And I don't care that there's not a government mandate for them to get it from us. You know? No, um, I, I agree. I, I think it would be a good program hmm. to have. I'm just saying that there would be a difference on the legal side if between mm -hmm. the one man, the one requirement and the other are wanting to help people. Uh, no. I, I, would call, I wouldn't call it a mandate. It's a fee. It's the cost of joining the system. It's right. like the cost of yeah. joining the well. It's a, right. it's a product we sell. It's not a, a service. But, but it's, a, it's a cost that is being mandated by the water department. If you want to be on our system, you must pay this. Yeah. Those people have the choice of digging their own well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Sorry, it's, semantics. It's, not, it's not a big difference yeah. in thinking. No, but it, there there is a legal difference, even if it is not a yeah, a practical difference. I have a que I have a question. Mm, go right ahead, Teresa. Um, do we know how much money is in the water district money? I mean, it's it. I'm all for having supporting 
um, having COVID relief have some kind of a fund. But I do think if those people were paying into the water district, and if there is money available, that money should come out of there. <laughs> I don't understand why it wouldn't. So if I understand what you're if saying. If I had $10,000 in my savings account, and I said to you, gee, I need to hook up to the water, but I need your money. You'd say to me, excuse me, you have $10,000 in your savings account. So you have the money to pay for it. That's my question is about the money in the water district. I'm all for helping people. I'm all for establishing a fund. And I totally agree with it being used for wells or hooking up to the water district. But I don't understand why the water district is not using their money to help connect the people that can't afford it that we're paying into it all these years. Could I ask a question to kind of clarify? It sounds like you're getting back to the issue that Fred Orlowski brought up about um, what the, uh, the assets of the right. water district will be like after the whole merger is over. Right. Um, what are, I, and and I, I thought this had come up in the agreement that those assets were being transferred, but I could be wrong. Transferred to who? To the town or to the, to the, water, the, water, to the water department? department? Yeah. And then the water department is then in, like when I, but I was thinking of assets in terms of pumps and tanks and those well, sorts of I'm things. I'm thinking of cash at this point, not the. Yeah. My understanding is that that cash was part of the deal, but I could be wrong. I don't think that has ever been decided on, Joyce. It was brought up mm -hmm. in the committee meetings earlier, but no action was taken. Mm -hmm. What would do with that? What would happen with that money? after the water district was was dissolved. Mm -hmm. Well, do any of the commissioners have an idea of what the cash assets would be would be at the end of this? Are we talking about $5,000 or $500 or $50,000 or I mean, what, what kind of assets are we talking about? I don't about? think they had that much assets. I think they had around $15,000 or something like that. So that would the two people that are interested in getting financial assistance, that would take care of them. Yes, that's, that's possible. I think the other thing you need to consider if, if the town wants to set up this revolving account or whatever you want to call it uh, for a handful of people, you're going to spend more on probably administering the account and, and monitoring it and collecting fees and all that than, than it would be to, say, use the assets of the water district. Uh, I guess, which is, you're going to spend more trying to figure it out, administer it, uh, advertise it, and deal with the people that want the, the few people that want the money rather than, say, go to the district because it's easier to get from the district. And, and the other question, uh, Brian, what does the town do for people that don't pay taxes on time? Do we do we have an account where they can borrow money or, or do we charge them interest on it? Or what do we do in them cases? If people don't pay taxes? Right. Uh, but yeah, there's 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 uh, fees and, and interest that's collected on it. Okay, but we don't provide them a banking system to uh, pay monthly or whatever, do we? That's on their own. I mean, we carry it as uncollected taxes and there's remedies within state law to, to eventually collect that. Okay. And, and just a just point about the water district, just, just a point of clarification, the water district is, while it's a public entity, it's not under the, under the, the, the authority and control of the, the town of Waitley. Um, if I recall, and it's been a little while, they don't have a lot of liquid assets, um, and they they have some costs that they need to do to um, wind down their affairs. Um, 
I believe they have a piece of property that they that that they were hoping to possibly sell. And my understanding is that is that they don't expect to have much left at the end of the day. Um, and what they did have left, I believe there was talk about about dispersing it amongst the members of the water district. Um, and yeah, certain, uh, and Joyce is right, certain, certain hard assets, you know, the pipes, the, uh, the pipes, the um, certain parts. Pumps. Of, yeah, the pumps, the, the, I think the body of the meters and, and things like that were going to be transferred to the town because essentially the district is, is going to <laughs> no longer exist. Um, so, um, that, that's just like ever, where it stands. But was the question ever posed to the water district to ask them if they would support people who could not afford to um, hook up to the water department? Yes or no? And if it was yes, they were asked and they said, this is what we're doing with it, that's fine. But we have no, even no clear understanding whether they were asked if they would support people to hook up to the water department. Well, we've got several of them here. <laughs> so, can, of the but, have you ever been asked? I, I think what, what, what I remember happening, the water district did a survey, I think, of their 40 whatever members and asked how many would join or how many had difficulty financially joining and they came up with, a, I guess, a, a handful, uh, but I don't, I don't recall it ever going beyond that, saying that we're going to help the handful that need help to, to finance it. I, I don't think it, it was anything beyond that. It was more to show that there was support for joining the water department for the two merging. Right. And, and right. that's-, that's could, We have, com yeah, we have some commissioners here. So yeah, maybe was, the commissioners uh, could address that if they were discussed. Um, the possibility of using assets of the water district. I think we had a couple meetings and people a year and a half, two years who might ago, have trouble. And they said that the assets that they had, that like uh -oh. Brian said, they needed to close out the system and that, and then they were going to divide what they had up between the 40 residents. That was my understanding too. I would, so they I would. chose not to help the residents that needed to be needed. It's it's never, I didn't, it was I'm not never sure brought I heard up. everything. I feel well, like maybe, could the water there isn't a direct answer to Teresa's question. Could the water commissioners please ask the water department or district if they would support that? I, I'm I happy to come that question to uh to nicholas um how i'm happy to convey that question how does that how does that impact whether the whether the the select board of the town would would offer a a revolving revolving loan program or or does it um well, me, pers me personally, I think you should set up that um, help for people to get on water. Um, I don't know what the, all the um, ins and outs of maintaining that account. That's what you, you're familiar with, Brian, and whether it, it's more trouble than it's worth or it's no trouble whatsoever. And we can just have that money in that account because if it's COVID money, Right now, it's free money for us. Yep. I guess I would like to see some information come from the water district to the to the town saying what their assets are and the current status of what it is. We've seen it two, three years ago. Current status of what their assets are and how they propose to uh, dispose of them uh, before I, I guess the select board takes an action on this and before we set up a revolving fund. 
That's why I would suggest that that happens. No, um, I'm the thing I'm going keeps going around in my head is, well, it seems like the water commissioners won't have a great idea of what they'll have left over at the end. So they decided that whatever's left over at the end, we disperse among the members who've been, who've been coughing up the money all these years. Um, I think if they knew what all of their closing costs were gonna be, you know, like would it, having that information, would it change the idea that maybe we should have a fund to help people get like a clean water fund or a drinking water fund and, and make that, uh, make it equitable um, so that people who are not on the current system or too far away to be on the current system could get help in different ways, the way that's appropriate for them. Um, you know, help with digging a well. And I, I really don't think it's gonna be that many people per year because it's gonna be income tested and I don't know that getting that information from the water commissioners would have an impact either way. What if they say we have got zero left, then obviously they can't take care of those folks. If they said we have some amount we don't know, that might be about $15,000. There's still the I don't know about it. <laughs> so I, I don't, I mean, I understand it's very logical Fred to want that information before making a decision, but I also don't know that it would affect um, the the decision. It, does, it doesn't affect the kind of the greater need of the whole community for for clean drink, drinking water. Does that make sense? I'd like to throw in that it does because that water district is to be as a private system, and the private mm -hmm. system is liquidating, which means it's going to have to it's going to cost them money. Right. To rid of the hardware. Oh, yeah. Could it cost them money to shut down those wells permanently? Right. So it costs them to yeah. That, yeah. And the pipe all and the pipe and the valves and all that stuff is just incorporated into the system. The town system is connecting it to that. They're connecting the town right. system. So whatever they have left is probably going to be nil or very little by the time they pay the fees. Mm. So whatever you if you want and, to and there will be yeah. revolving funds and whatnot to help people out, that's wonderful. But I, that whatever they have for assets, just forget about it. There's nothing there. I, I think Joyce, they, they had a breakdown. I remember seeing other assets in whether it was cash or land values or uh, future revenues or whatever. There was a breakdown of that. And yeah. I think that's what needs to be asked for and looked at rather than, I hear what you're saying, but it's like, well, we don't think they have money left or they're gonna need it to uh, do this or that or legal, legal things. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had a breakdown. There was a spreadsheet showing that, and I think that's important to find out to get a, to see that again, so we know exactly what the costs are, not just guessing. Well, it's only this, or it's not going to be this. Uh, I think we need more definitive numbers from the water district. Well, well, okay. So I guess I'm looking at it fundamentally differently. We've got a chance with some COVID money to establish something so that no matter where you live in town, if you're having trouble with your water, you can either get a connection if you're geographically close, or you can get help with a interest-free loan to build a well, okay? We've got that chance with the COVID money. You're arguing that, well, if the district has some money, they should put it in first before we use this free COVID money and I don't see the rationale for that. I agree with Joyce completely on that. It, we're setting up a new program, not just a program which happens to coincide with the shutting down of the water district. And we should, I think, fund it through the COVID money rather than possibly even delaying it, waiting to see what the final balance yeah. is for the district after everything is closed down. And we have no idea how long that's actually going to be at this point. You're, you're talking two different systems. You're, you're talking of the, the system in the center of town for the 40 plus people versus 
other people in town that they want access to this program. I think they're, they're two different things we're talking about here. No, we're talking uh, about a town-wide town program to help people get clean drinking water, whether mm -hmm. through the water department or through help if they need financial help in improving or sinking a well. Well, that's, that's the program we're talking about here, and it, I don't think it really has anything to do with the water district. Well, no, it that's something to. different. So I, I guess I'm puzzled by how that's related to the discussion of, of the water district, I, I guess. That's another program mm -hmm. we should be talking about. Yeah, yeah. well, it would, it would help solve the problem of the few people who are trying, who are, would have trouble paying the fee on the water district merger. And it would actually, and, and I think this is really important. It would address some, I would call it equity issues with people who can't get on the water system. You know, if we're, gonna, if we're willing to do, to, you know, if we wanna help people get clean water, let's do it for everybody. And so, so yes, this idea sort of came up from various people's comments and it's not, and you're, you're saying it's not related to the agenda item. So um, maybe that's something. <laughs> maybe that's something that we should uh, take up at another meeting as well. We're certainly not going to make a final decision tonight, but maybe, I mean, my sense is we want to look into that okay. as a way, um, establishing or evolving fund. And I know the COVID money is another item on the agenda. So maybe we could delay more discussion on this until then. Um, but it, it sure does seem like... Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to get anything out of the assets of the, or not any certainty on the assets of the water district. And it's, uh, we don't want to wait that long for people to be able to get clean water. I support your idea. 150% of establishing a clean water revolving fund or whatever assistance. But I also would like to know how much money is in that account? Simple then, as that. Okay, then the, we have water commissioners who meet publicly, and I think that's a good question to bring to them. Uh, and I think our town would be no, would be um, praised for having such type of a program to help people have clean water, having gone through the water crisis with um, uh, farming pesticides in water. I know what it is not to have clean water. Yeah, I think it would make the, the town just a more attractive place for people to want to live, knowing that there's a safety net program like that for water. So, so maybe we put a cap on it by by the board asking the town administrator to pursue the or, or research more details on the establishment of, of a revolving fund for clean drinking water. I think that's a great idea. In town, I agree. It's a great idea. Let's, I'll let him let, know. Let's yeah, let him know <laughs> and tell him we love him very much in the completely appropriate way. All right. <laughs> Well, All right. Let me so. ask a question to the water commissioners. Are, are there people in town that can't afford to be on the existing system? I mean, not, not the water district, uh, in areas in town. Are there people that can't afford it or, or aren't on it? Or what's happening in that case if they come and say, well, I can't afford the hookup fee? What, 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 what do you do? We haven't had anybody approach us. Nobody has approached, okay. No. I've been approached by one person who has suggested, actually, I think in a public meeting, yet, that their family member is currently not on the water and can't afford to get on the water. Well, no one's ever attended any of our meetings. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Brian. That was very useful to find out there was somebody interested. So that's even more um, reason to set up that account. 
yeah, when we had talked about this at a, at a prior meeting, it, the individual asked the question about the, the scope of if we were going to provide some sort of relief or or extended payment plan if it would be if it would be uh, offered to others in the town and talked about the very specific situation. Hmm. Okay, well, I sense we've come to the end of that item. Um, we've got one more item of old business, and that is uh, to discuss the process or plan for spending future revenues. And there's the Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, or CLIFRF, um, uh, and community impact fees, et cetera. But I think it's mostly the coronavirus um, that was talked about in our meeting materials. So Brian, maybe I turn it over to you again. Yeah, uh, Fred and I had, had Fred and I had a discussion about about the 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 corona. We'll just call it COVID monies because it's easier. Um, the COVID monies and really um, the process of of how we're going to spend those. Right, we know that the we're, we're pretty sure that income is coming to the town. There's, I believe, five eligible categories. Um, it's not an insignificant amount of money. And um, some towns I know have been setting up um, advisory committees. I think they're larger towns that are getting more money than us um, to uh, provide advice to the, whether it's a select board or town council, depending on the size of the town. Um, as to what projects should be funded. Um, and that conversation also led to, um, at some point, hopefully the town will, will, will receive local excise tax monies from, from retail sales of marijuana and community impact fees, um, also from uh, host community agreements, so long as those are, um, you know, uh, permissible in mass. So um, I don't know if, if Fred wants to, to, to add something to that. Yeah, it, it, if I can, I think it's really two separate things. The, the COVID money has specific purposes, it has uh, restrictions on how it can be used. It can't just be put into general funding. But at least according to the, uh, what I saw the 2018 uh, state regulations, Marijuana money just gets put in, put into the general fund. I think that we need to have a sort of a larger, higher view of what we, how we want to deal with the money. Do we want to just leave it in general funds, you know, in free cash essentially, uh, to reduce taxes in any given year? Do we want to set it aside for specific types of projects? Uh, what, especially given that it's not necessarily going to be, or, or we don't know yet if it's going to be a stable source of revenue. We don't know how many retail outlets are going to be continue in business for one, two, five years. We don't know what the uh, legalization in other states is going to do to the price of marijuana at, from the sellers. So I think a discussion of in policy terms rather than specific terms of how we want to handle money coming from these sources is worth having. Yeah. Well, I know in the past I've I have voiced the view that our the um, community impact fee money because it is supposed to be spent on particular things really should be not in like the general fund it should be in a separate kind of fund and my understanding is that until recently there wasn't a way to do that but now there is that you can set up a stabilization fund and that would have that'd be a place to put your, the money from an impact fee, because we don't really know what the impacts are gonna be until things happen. Um, and you have a place to put it so that it's not something that you're tempted to 
you know, take like free cash and reduce everybody's taxes and then, you know, find out later you need it for, uh, for other impacts. You can't, you can't, you shouldn't really be using the impact fee for in that way. So I think for the impact fee, I think that's a good idea. For the retail sales, I feel less strongly about that. I think that could go into the general fund. Partly also because it, it may not be, I have no idea how much it would be, um, but it's kind of like the, the food, the local option uh, meals tax that goes into the general fund. It's just another one of our small sources of revenue. No, yes, the, the problem is at this point, we don't have really have any idea how big a source of revenue it's gonna be. It could right. be quite substantial, it might not be. I'm just worried about putting into a general fund, having essentially using it for a tax cut for one year or you know a couple of years while it's mm. a new thing having right. it dry up and suddenly then having to go back with a big tax increase mm. to cover what right. we've now come to expect when it doesn't come through anymore. Right. Well, you can say the same thing about the meals tax, you know, when all the restaurants yeah, but that, that's a much smaller amount. Right? This, if we're talking about an amount that could, we don't, be, uh, could be fairly large, mm. you know, if we're right. going to have, you know, again, we don't have any idea how much it's going to be. But if we have two or three right. successful retail operations, you know, two at uh, Sugarloaf shops selling marijuana to people going to mm -hmm. and from Yankee Candle, it could be quite successful and quite lucrative for the town. Uh, but again, you know, one of those places yeah. closes and all of a sudden some of the revenue dries up. I'm yeah. just looking to stabilize the, the town's finance. Keep the, town's finances mm. as stable as possible and not subject it to variations of uh, mm -hmm. of incomes that we can't control. Right. Yeah, in that case, you're saying the reason to um, kind of, I don't know, sequester might not be the right word, but to kind of sequester um, retail excise tax money is because you're saying that's that could go up and down. Um, right. that's a different reason than uh, sequestering the local impact fee money. The local impact fee may vary also as their greater supply of the product comes onto market from other places. Mm -hmm. the, you know, right. if, if more, more farms in other towns and states come online, suddenly the price on the market drops. Mm-hmm. I, I think we should be looking more at some long range planning activities. And, and by that, I, I mean, right, you're still looking here. At, looking at, right. I didn't come in here because I figured you were busy. I didn't want to just disturb you. Looking at, looking at future needs of, of the town, uh, starting maybe with the capital improvement planning committee. You know, that committee recommends capital projects every year. Uh, doesn't recommend all the projects because there's either not enough money or there isn't a, a great need to do some of that. Uh, that that committee has been successful in, in getting some long range activities from some of the committees. Uh, I think the school committee finally has, has shared some long range needs. Uh, as compared to the past, it was just one year, two years, and that was it. We never knew what else was, was coming down the road uh, from them. They've developed a long-range plan for improvements. Uh, the library has had one for quite a few years. Uh, I think we've asked the water department to develop something because there's future needs, either expansion or addressing current current issues. Uh, and, and I, I think that, that either that committee or an expansion of that committee should, should be looking at, at a longer range planning needs, longer range capital improvement needs, if you want to call it, for the town. And if we get this additional money to focus on, on some of the needs, most of them are, are current or immediate needs. They're not something that's really different that we haven't heard about before that we want to fund because it's something new and exciting. No, it's current needs that have been around that they're on a schedule to be to be implemented in the future whenever we get money. So 
you know, whether you call it the Capital Improvement Planning Committee or some other committee, I, I think it's important that, that we look more at long range planning, long range projects, proposals, see, see what we need. If we have more money come available, let's implement some of them projects. Uh, yeah. You know, the, well, that, that, that's exactly why we need to have this discussion to decide yeah. is that our priority? Is keeping, you know, is lowering taxes in the current year the priority? What, what's the priority for using that money? Clearly, Fred, your idea, perfectly valid one, is use it for capital projects, long term yeah. capital projects. That's fine. Okay. But, that, but that's the discussion we need to have. Okay. The one, the one capital yeah. project that, that hasn't, come up yet because it's kind of been, I don't know if you call it postponed or, or not really time for that. It's gonna be a big expense is replacing the Christian Lane Bridge. It's the only bridge in town other than maybe Williamsburg Road that has weight restrictions. And Keith does maintenance of that bridge every year to make it safe and maintained the way it is today, but there's weight restrictions. That bridge is eventually going to be need replacement. That's a several million dollar project. That's what that's going to be. Uh, asking either for uh, hopefully state funding, uh, bridge improvement projects, and, and this, the town may have to come up with a match. That's a big capital improvement need that's in the horizon. And Fred, Fred, I think you're too far in the weeds on this. I'm looking for a bird's eye view of the landscape not the specific projects that may or may not be funded well i think what in general do we want to do with the money not this pro we also have a highway department buildings can need fixing we've got right. projects that will need to be done but that's not the discussion here the discussion here is how do we want to treat this money in a general sense but i, I think all that needs to come together and, and looking at our future needs Fine. That's that's one one way to look at it, and yes, yeah. that's a strong possibility. But it's not the only thing that people would propose to do with this influx of money. Well, I think we, we can't forget the needs that keep getting pushed back further and further. I mean, uh, Keith will tell you that for for his needs as you know highway needs as well. It's major expenses. Okay. Um, I wonder, Brian, um, if we're thinking of, I don't know, let's say shorter term uses of the COVID money and also kind of longer term um, income from, I would say primarily the excise tax part of marijuana sales. Yep. That you say other towns have formed like an ad hoc committee to advise on that. And maybe, maybe that's an approach we could take. I, I mean, if we had folks from say the finance committee, from capital improvement, someone from the school committee, we we'll kind of look at all the major cost centers in town um, and see what kind of things those groups come up with. And I think it's a little tricky because COVID money has certain things you can spend it on and others you can't. So like my understanding is we couldn't spend any COVID money on housing, <laughs> right? Um, yep. But we could potentially um, look at uh, you know, the, the newer revenues that may come from marijuana to address things like housing. So, uh, but, it, it, but it seems to me I would want to hear from those folks uh, as well. And I know we've got Jim here from finance committee, Fred, you used to be on finance committee um, and other Fred with capital improvement. Um, the people that are missing are the schools, which is about two thirds of our budget. Um, so I wonder if getting a group who's willing to think about this issue and get back to us in a few weeks or probably more realistically September. Um, did I, do you think I missed any groups who might want to be invited to that conversation? I mean, I would also think of 
a select man would want to be there as well. We wouldn't have to send all of us, but have uh, at least one of us there. I, I think that that's, sounds like a good approach to dealing with this. George, we, we kind of have that with a capital improvement planning committee that's recently been well, the last couple of years reorganized and the, the intent there was not to have department heads on the committee because they would just promote their, their individual projects other than the school committee. The school committee is a member, but everybody else on that committee is not a department head so far. And we wanted to get independent, unbiased, unprejudiced, whatever uh, yeah. assessments and views. So uh, I don't think I suggested we have any department heads on there. If you put in this committee together, yeah. How do you, who do you put on there? Uh, Okay, I, I think I interrupted you, Joyce. Go ahead. Were you saying something? Oh, I was just saying, I, I don't think I suggested that we put all the department heads in a room and let them decide. Yeah. But uh, your point is well taken that the, we should avoid making uh, this group just a uh, committee of department heads. All right. But I think um, one person who I would like to have in the room is Brian, because he kind of knows what the rules are for spending the money probably better than anybody else and can kind of keep us from wasting a lot of time going down, um, you know, chasing down ideas that are never gonna get funded out of anything. Right? Um, but I sort of feel like this, it, it seems to me it's, so, it's an obvious fit with the finance committee that they should have someone there. Um, uh, and the, the schools where a lot of our money goes and the long, um, I mean, I remember when I first moved to this town, we had like 10 years of zero capital improvement spending. And, and it took a lot to get us out of that hole. At least we have done some capital um, improvement spending. And I think we really do need to have the, the people who are familiar with our capital needs on there as well. So I think your point is well taken, Fred, about um, about who could who should be there? Um, and, no, I, I completely uh, but, agree. Uh, so, I'm sorry, sorry, Joyce. No, I, I think the finance committee has to be intimately involved with this. This is their job, yeah. is to figure out how and where to spend money and make set the priorities. And really, that that's what this is. This is a question of setting the priorities for a certain pool or pools of money that we have not had before to spend. Yeah. So this is uh, not, not something, this isn't for department heads. This is a policy yeah. issue, not a, uh, a district, you know, not, not talking about how we're spending particular money, but how we yeah. want to spend the money in general. Yeah. I think Joyce's suggestion has merit. Uh, as a finance committee member, I'm not willing to, to weigh in on this yet because I just don't know enough about it. I need more information and, and need to, to, to get more information about, about the whole um, program and everything. So, But I think Joyce's uh, recommendation has a lot of merit. Yeah, Jim, I, I, I completely agree. If this discussion we're having here is not how we spend the money. It's how we talk about how we spend the money. Yeah. And so there's no need for you to have any ideas about the, the end solution at this point. We're setting up a process. Okay. Um, so for tonight's meeting, um, what do we need to decide? Do we have sort of a wish list of uh, groups to be represented um, or even specific people. Um, but we do want input from finance and from capital improvement and maybe more than one person from capital improvement because that may be where, um, that was, I think it's where a lot of our needs are. Um, I, I think more than one from water finance because, too. Yeah, more than one from finance. Um, uh, I think, Water department might be special in the sense that the COVID money 
some of it is then one big category is safe drinking water. So it might be good to have uh, someone knowledgeable about the water department, whether it's the water department head. I mean, he's the only employee in the water department, so it'd be hard to pick um, a different person. Um, but uh, he always, uh, he may also be represented on the capital planning committee. But I do I do kind of see we, the schools. We wouldn't have to have a school committee member necessarily if they had a, a person. Um, that they'd rather send if they wanted to send, uh, you know, the principal or um, uh, another staff member, someone who might be um, knowledgeable about the kinds of needs they have. So I see kind of those as the big three, capital, finance, and schools. And if I can suggest a seven, try to find a seven person committee, I think once you get more than that, you, it gets unwieldy. I, I'd like to recommend that someone from the Board of Health be on it. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, if, well, let's hope that current trends don't continue, but if yeah. we have to put some shifts and resources to public health, um, mm. I think it would, it would be good to have a represent, uh, representative from the Board of Health. Mm. Okay, so what okay. do we have? Board of Health, schools, say capital from, improvement, and say two finance. from finance. Two from finance. And Brian. Brian. And Brian. Well, Brian would probably be non-voting. Oh. And, and one from the select board. I'll volunteer either as assessor or the uh, housing committee. Oh, we were, I wasn't thinking of putting assessors or housing committee on there because okay. um, can't, we can't use the housing money. But aren't you also on capital improvement? Was. Was. I'd be at large if you want. I volunteer if you want to do it at large. But oh, oh, okay. Well, so Fred is uh, okay, but I think we've got different groups that need to designate their own representatives, and then yeah, I I'd be pretty adamant about it not getting too big because then when, when these groups get too big, they don't accomplish anything. Right. But okay, yeah. so. Is this something different than the capital improvement planning committee, or is that something we should should consider reorganizing that committee to address this and future needs? Uh, it, giving it to the capital improvement committee presupposes that we're going to use this money for capital improvements, which isn't a foregone conclusion. Yeah, I, I would recommend that this be. Uh, in my mind, I, I kind of think of the 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 CLFRF money as as what the main mission of this committee would be, um, mm -hmm. because when we talk about local excise tax for marijuana or food or anything, right now that's going into the general fund and that's being used to offset general revenue expenses, uh, general fund expenses. Um, so if if we're going, we'll have to have a discussion about setting up these stabilization funds if we want to. Um, Knowing that that's going to pull that money out of out of our out of our general fund, so in my mind, there's kind of two separate discussions that we've kind of lumped in here. Um, but yeah. it, it's so two, it's, just, it's two it's two separate discussions on the same general topic. Yep. But I we can set we can set the priorities and say we'll deal with the COVID money first, and how that how to handle that, and then when that is resolved, move on to the Right, uh, excise tax money, which at that point we should, several months down the road, have a better idea of actually what how much it's going to be. Yeah, and I also, uh, and, uh, Jim can chime in on this too, but I also think that if we're talking about policy decisions about about how we're dealing with revenue into general revenue or stable uh, or setting up stabilizations count, it's probably a discussion maybe with the full finance committee as well. Um, but agreed, agreed. So yeah, I think I think the main thing would, would be, you know, how are we, how are we going to prioritize? This? Well, how are we going to prioritize our spending for the for the coronavirus relief? Yeah. COVID monies. Okay. It, do do we want a a motion 
on this? Yeah. Yeah, I would think I'd like to move to to set up a ad hoc committee consisting of two members of the finance committee, a member of the select board, a representative from the board of health, capital improvement committee, schools and water district to study the issue of spending or uh, budgeting. Prioritizing. Well, from, prioritizing. from making recommendations to the select board on. Recommendations spending. to the select board on how to handle new revenue streams to the town. I second that. Okay, so is there any further discussion? Okay, then uh, I'll take a roll call vote. Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. All right, passes. So, so Brian, can you notify the various people who need to send representation and yeah yep yeah no, it's now in brian's lap this. okay great thank you brian yep thank you brian okay so on on to new business the first item under uh new business is to discuss and vote on a request for the select board to not exercise its right of first refusal under Mass General Law Chapter 61A to purchase the land located at the corner of State Road and Christian Lane, the parcel ID 19011, currently owned by Full Bloom Market Garden LLC. So for those in the audience, and Brian will correct me if I get this wrong, um, this agricultural land is um, under Chapter 61, which has gave some benefits to the farmers and owners in terms of taxes. Um, they're selling the land uh, and it is at least under current statute, uh, a new use of the land. So uh, in that case, since it's chapter land, we have, we get to turn them down first is what the right of first refusal is. So if we exercise our option to purchase this land, we've got 90 days to come up with $12 million. And I've got, I've got Brian all over that. He's looking under all the couch cushions. So far, we don't have $12 million. Just 11. Um, just a, yeah, 11 cents, right? Yeah, 11 so, cents. <laughs> so that's one of our options is to come up with $12 million and purchase this land for the town. Our other option is to say, we don't want to buy it. Um, so the, the language, I, the language is funny. It's got this sort of double negative quality to it. But if we we have the right of first refusal, so we can refuse or we can buy it. And maybe I'll just say it as plainly as that. Um, and the uh, because the land's going to a separate use, it would come out of Chapter sixty one until such time as the, the, the law of the land may be changed, but current law says this is a change in use. If I got most of that right? Okay. Yeah, I, so I that's, believe so. So to me, that's the only question that's on the table. The, I mean, the question is not, is chapter 61 a good law? Uh, is it really a change in use? I think that's unambiguous under the current law. Um, so we either have $12 million or we don't. Uh, and if we had $12 million, is that what we would spend it on? <laughs> so, um, so to me, the question seems really, really black and white, um, but I should let other people have a, uh, have a chance to say something. Joyce, I just, I just want to add one thing. Town Council reminded me, and you actually already did it, but um, under the um, under the regulations, the board needs to solicit comment from from anybody. It needs to be in the nature of a public hearing. So, you having solicited comment uh, checks that box. So oh. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Well, I've got six people uh, plus Fred and Brian, and nobody's speaking up at this point. I can't believe we don't have any comments. 
one thing I would say is I don't know what we would do with that that parcel of land, even if we did buy it. Yeah. I, I guess it'd do the same thing that it's being done here today. Yeah. With yeah. under town ownership, which would be a whole new entity that I don't think we need to uh, get involved in. Can I ask? Uh, like, does any any further comment? I'd then like to make a motion that the town not exercise its right of first refusal to purchase this property. I mean, not exercise the option. Not to exercise purchase. the right to purchase the property. In other words, we pass okay. on the opportunity. Um, before I second that, Brian, you had something you were going to add. Oh, I was just going to uh, welcome John back and ask him. To give us an update on the on the project, if you could. Is John here? I don't see He's him here. No, John. Uh, John Dewey. Oh, John Dewey. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Brian, good good to see you, uh, Joyce you Red. Uh, my good friend Teresa Jones. Um, <laughs> I mean Dewitt. Good to see you. Um, it's been a while. Uh, it's been what is that? Eighteen months or so of pandemic. Um, the project has been advancing. I will tell you uh, the major milestones achieved since we last, uh, last saw each other in uh, summer of 2019. Our tenant, Dr. Rob Farms, went through the state uh, CCC licensing process. That took them about 12 months to get through that process. The state approved for them a tier 11 license in October of last year and just a month or so ago, the state also approved their architectural review form. So that was the last, one of the last milestones that allow us to finish up the building plans, which we intend to submit into uh, Franklin County probably within the next 60 days or so. Uh, the other thing I'd request, Brian, if the town um, does not exercise its right to purchase that you could also issue a formal waiver uh, to us. You were town council that you waive your right to purchase. That's something our attorneys were asking for. And that will allow Mustang to complete uh, the purchase of the property from DeWitt. Uh, we would close on that purchase next week. Um, we still have another six months or so to go to complete a number of additional items with our tenant. Um, we look to more than likely start construction of some renovations to the greenhouse, I'm going to say after the first of the year. Um, finishing up building plans, building permits, uh, tenant improvements. Uh, you may have heard that the economy is going through a bit of a, a building boom these days. There was a lot of pent up demand for projects, so our, our contractor is having to compete for subcontractor bids and materials and quantities. So we like to finish up all the formal uh, bid process with our contractor and subs before we uh, pursue construction. Uh, as the potential uh, owner of the property, we, may, we remain very excited about the opportunity. Our tenant is excited about the opportunity as well. Our tenant has been very busy over the last two years uh, building out about 150,000 square foot of buildings in Southern California. They're on their uh, third or fourth harvest cycle in one of the 50,000 square foot buildings. They're on their second harvest cycle in another building, and they've been producing product for about 18 months in their first building. So uh, Dr. Rob Farms is now up to about 125 employees. They continue a very uh, robust growth. If any of you make it out to Southern California for any other reasons, we'd love to have you tour the Dr. Rob Farms facility because I think you'd really enjoy seeing what a, a very large scale commercial uh, cannabis production facility looks like. Very sophisticated you know, CO2 dosing equipment and fertigation that mixes um, a lot of very good nutrients. Um, so we look forward to making that transition to help the community realize some of those tax revenues that you're, uh, you're planning to have your committee figure out how to spend them. So we'll hopefully fulfill our responsibility and, 
and put some of the green uh, green dollars into the pump to uh, to benefit the community. So uh, happy to entertain any other questions from uh, any of the board or any other uh, members on the call today. Uh, just just a just a quick follow up. Um, in the way for the waiver, um, or, or for the yeah, the, the notice of, of non exercise, um, who who needs to be CC'd on that? Obviously, it's going to be issued to DeWitt, um, and DeWitt will forward it to yeah. anybody else. Who 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 wants to? Who might want to review the language? I guess is my question. If, if you address it to a DeWitt and copy his attorney Dan Rothschild at okay. Bulky, um, that'll yeah. find its way to uh, to me and my attorney. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question was the, have all the conditions of the planning and ZBA and maybe host community agreement been addressed for the existing property owner or, and are any of them gonna continue with you as new owner? Yes. I believe that all the conditions of approval, particularly the uh, site plan approval, uh, that dictated most of the conditions of development. Um, you know, I think the relevant ones I require, there's some landscaping requirements, there's some security requirements that uh, police, uh, there's some fire conditions that are weighed in. All of those conditions remain, but they are likely to be filled when we go through our construction process. So do you need to meet with planning and fire department to go over them conditions? No, we've, we've already done that. Our, uh, our civil engineer, who you guys know uh, quite well, Chris, he has been out and taken into account all those conditions. And when you go from conditions to very specific uh, building plans for building permits, uh, they get obviously a little bit more detailed in the process. And uh, Chris Chamberlain has taken all that into account in his building permit set of plans. All right. Um, do we have any, any other uh, comments that people want to make at this point? Okay. Uh, DeWitt, any questions from DeWitt? questions here. Now, wasn't there a host community agreement signed for that property? Is that going to continue? No, Fred, the yes. host community agreement oh, is, is, with, yeah. is with the new, the people who are going to own it are the people who have the host community agreement. We didn't make the host agreement with the community, uh, for, since we, with the current owner, we made it with the people who are going to buy. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, but well, it sounds like we're we're kind of out as questions now. Um, I have uh, the uh, is that, if it's okay with you, Fred. I'm going to restate the motion Fine. Um, in the uh, pre in the language perhaps preferred by our town council. Okay, which would be um, I move that the board vote not to exercise or assign the option to purchase the property on Christian Lane, Assessor's Parcel 19-0-11 as described in the notice of intent to sell dated July 9th, 2021 from attorney, attorney Daniel M. Rothschild on behalf of the property owner, Full Bloom Market Garden LLC, and to notify the landowner of this decision. I will second so that. That's my motion. Seconded. Okay, is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for a roll call vote. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank, all right. Thank you all. And uh, Brian, if you get a draft of the, you know, the, the motion and the approval and the waiver to uh, DeWitt and Dan Rothschild, um, I, I'm sure it'll be fine. Thank you okay. so much. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, Fred. Thank you, John. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Brian. Take care. All right. Okay, very good. We've got two more things and then uh, town administrator updates. 
so the next item under new business is to appoint uh, our town administrator, Brian Domina, uh, as the fiscal year 22 Franklin Regional Planning Board representative. And I happily move to appoint Brian Domina to Franklin Planning Board representative. Well, since Brian seems so excited at this, I will second. Okay, is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Thank I'll you. go to a roll call vote. <laughs> go ahead, uh, Fred. Yes. Joyce, yes. Okay, very good. Um, and there were some chapter 90 project requests. Um, now the email I got didn't actually have any attachments on it that I could find, okay. Um, no, they did not. Okay. And um, I, so I didn't know if there was supposed to be, but I'll turn it over to Brian to talk about that. Uh, no, the, the email from Keith doesn't. I, I have the, the print copy out in the hallway here to be signed. <laughs> okay. Um, just a heads up, Master T has switched to a, a new format for the form. So um, there's there are sticky notes to let, let you guys know where it's signed. But um, okay. So for the chapter 90 project request that Keith is looking for approval is for cracked ceiling on River Road from the Hatfield Waitley town line to Straits Road. Um, and that's mm -hmm. what he's seeking approval for. Um, and at that, not part of the same request, but at the same time, he's going to arrange for the, the cracked ceiling of the, the canyons and the parking lot outside the town offices. Oh, okay. All righty. So that is it something we need to vote on that? Or do we um, just need to come in and sign it? It's usually just signatures that that, that okay. Happen. Okay. Um, and how soon do you need the signature? <coughs> um so I'll be back the evening of the 30th, which is a Friday. Over tomorrow. So, okay. If not, I can. I could, John I could, can still sign him. It doesn't matter that he's not at this meeting. Yeah, it's John a matter of signing. Sign him okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, I'd be happy to be in there like August 1st. Sign All right. Well, I'll let you know. <laughs> if um, it's still out there, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Okay. And then I think um, that was it for, and we're up to town administrator updates, my favorite part. Yep. Uh, this is the good news section. Yeah. Um, so um, as um, as the board knows, the town was awarded a, a culvert replacement grant for just over uh, $57,000. And that's going to pay for uh, design and engineering to redo the culvert um, on Christian Lane. That's between, um, it's adjacent to Castaways, essentially, between Castaways and Zawinski's. Um, so that's good. It's it's an example, I think, of as, as we talk about what to do with our COVID money. Is one of the things that I that I would encourage us to think about is there's a lot of so there's some I don't say a lot, but there's there's infrastructure money out there um, in terms of MassWorks grants, in terms of um, federal transportation funding, but neither of those sources pay for design, and that's where a lot of communities get get stuck. Is that towns are towns are on the hook for design essentially? Haydenville Road is an anomaly for us that that the states agreed to you know to, to pay for the hundred percent of the design. Um, but for a lot of our other uh, infrastructure projects and culverts, is uh, the the states willing to fund the, the construction? It's just how do you pay for design? And um, that's that's something that I, I think we need to think about as as some of the CLFRF money is eligible for what's not limited to just culverts, but infrastructure for thinking about water and designing those types of things as well and closing loops. And we've had this conversation before. Um, so anyways, I'll get off the soapbox. And so the town was also awarded a, a complete streets grant. Uh, that That's for $165,000 and some change. And that's nice. to uh, complete the remaining sidewalks on Chestnut Plain Road on the east side yeah side from 
across the street from the Congregational Church uh, to the Town Hall, and that will bring the sidewalk through the Veterans Memorial um, that's also being redone uh, this summer as well. So it's, it's good timing for that. Um, it'll also fund the construction of a multi-use path um, at the Waitley Elementary School from the existing sidewalk to Long Plain Road. Um, and it'll also allow some roadway improvements um, in West Waitley on Conway Road and for the purchase of some uh, uh, some more uh, speed feedback signs. Um, I guess also in the good news, good news front, I guess, um, the state approved the town's submission to opt out of the mosquito spraying program. So um, in the letter, it, it was a it was a sort of a generic template letter, but it it acknowledged the fact that this was, for lack of a better term, sprung on municipalities. It was a requirement that that happened very quickly in terms of the spraying program. It, it acknowledged that, so it they made it sound like they were very lenient in what they accepted for. I'm not mm. passing judgment on what we submitted, but they cautioned us that. Overall, they want to see more next year in terms of applications to opt, opt mm -hmm. out of the spring. And again, they reserved the right that, or, or they, they made known that um, they can, they're the owners of state-owned uh, state land. So um, there seemed to be a little hook there that um, if they wanted to spray on state land, that, that they had the right to do so. But we can cross, we can cross that bridge when we get there, or if we get there. Um, so we, in terms of grants, so we submitted the park grant application that we had talked about. Um, so that was a grant to, um, resurface or pave the Hurley Park driveway and parking lot, um, to, and to stripe it and to make sure that it, there's handicap accessibility, um, from the parking lot. So that means, you know, the, the correct number of handicapped spaces, signage, uh, the correct grade. Um, to install an app, uh, to install a, a hard surface path from the from the parking lot to the uh, restrooms and concession area pavilion. I'm not sure what it's called. It's kind of all three. Um, and then to make modifications to uh, the restrooms to make sure that that that's those are handicap accessible as well. Um, and as we'll recall that. That at the annual town meeting, there was funding that was passed for uh, the library ADA improvements um, and also the Veterans Memorial uh, renovations. So those projects will be moving forward. I know that the library trustees have been have got back in touch with uh, the project's architect to, to finalize those documents so we can get them out to bid and get that project started. And, and same with the Veterans Memorial project. Um, we'd like to move forward with that. In terms of, and as I think I, as, as I mentioned in my notes, in terms of the Complete Streets Grant Award and uh, obviously the culvert replacement design, our next steps for those um, are to obtain the services of uh, an engineer to help uh, design those projects. So. Hmm. Let me make one real right. quick comment on the, on the culvert money. I was talking to Keith about it, and one other advantage of getting the engineering money is it gives us a shovel-ready project. In case we get federal money that need shovel-ready projects, we'll have one ready to pull off the shelf. Yeah, yep, that's because um, all these acronyms, ERA, right? It was ERA 2010, yeah. America Rescue and Recovery mm -hmm. Act money. Yeah, The big emphasis was on shovel-ready projects. I, I'm not sure what the what's going to come out of Washington in terms of yeah. uh, infrastructure monies, but. Um, you never know, but it's good to have. Yeah, and yeah. In, in just thinking about that, I, if if it's true, and I, I think Keith has talked to me about it, but the the, the bridge on, uh, on Christian, I think it's the bridge on Christian Lane over the, over the, over the Mill River there, um, I think that's one of our oldest weight restricted bridges, so. Um, it's just another uh, just another pitch for design because that's something that could in theory be uh, be placed on the tip or federal highway funding because it's an eligible roadway. Again, design has to come from the town. So um, the sooner we can yeah. identify these projects and and 
and under, I, I think understand as, as a town that it's going to take some investment in design to get to the construction dollars that um, we'll, we'll yeah. get in the queue and we'll have yeah. shelf ready projects. So, um, yeah. Okay. I have a question about something, I guess not completely unrelated, but um, uh, where are we on the assistant town administrator? the new person, are we, have we actually got an ad out um, and get, are we getting resumes or are we not quite there yet? Um, we're not quite there yet. We're trying to fill um, Amy's position first, the admin assistant position. Oh, okay. Because Amy switched over to town clerk. So um, we had an ad okay. out for that and we're, we're she we have resumes. She, she can't do both jobs? She is currently, except, <laughs> except I get the meeting minutes this time because you know, she loves meeting minutes. Who doesn't? Right. Who doesn't? Right. Um, right. And so the so the next step of that is, um, I need to I need to um, finalize that job description and present it to the personnel committee. So watch your email for a personnel committee meeting invite. Okay. <laughs> um, and then that would come to the select board for approval of the job description. And, and okay. So, we just talk about so, range. Yeah. so the the ball is is rolling. We're just not at the point of of you telling us how many great resumes you have. It's going to be so difficult to decide between the, your top three candidates, or I should say our top three candidates. Yeah, that, that would be a nice no, we're not there have. yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and I have one item that was unanticipated when we get there. Mm -hmm. But we could be there now if you want to. I think we might be there. You've got I, I think we're there. Yeah. I think we're there. Okay. Um, so we did all of our appointments two meetings ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, um, we, had a, we had a mistake, one mistake. Um, so we need to appoint Allison Bell um, to the Historical Commission. The list had Darcy Tozer on, pointed to the oh. Historical Commission, but she had resigned kind of a couple months before the end of the year. So that never got changed. So if the board be willing to appoint okay. Allison well, back I, to the historical commission. Well, I move that we appoint Allison Bell back to the historical commission and we'll back pay. She gets back pay on that as well. Double, double. Yep. Double the back I, pay. Yeah. I, I will happily second that. Okay, do we need a roll call vote? Uh, yep. No. Okay, roll call vote, Fred. Yes. Joyce, yes. Okay. And, and then one other one other issue is that and we'll need to we'll need to think about this. And I Joyce, you're still on the cultural council, right? Yeah, I think I I go off in a couple of months, my term will be over. Oh goodness. Um yeah. uh, we also know that uh Julie Julie Wagoner, mm -hmm. um her term expired as well. She did she did two consecutive terms. So we'll have to we'll have to Oh, okay. We'll have to find somebody to fill that spot. So She's been on that for that long. Okay. I know. I, it feels like it. Uh, it feels like it wasn't that long, but. Yeah, I know. Okay. Then. But that's what I'm told by people well, who keep, we'll keep to, the database. Well, Julia is just going to have to find her replacement and report in, right? Okay. So, okay. Okay. Well, um, I don't see any business here. I entertain a mean uh, a motion to adjourn. Uh, we need to set the next meeting. Yep. Do we want to go back to the normal schedule of second and uh, second and last? Second. <coughs> so that'd be um, August eleventh and twenty fifth. Um, that's that's fine with me. Occasionally, we only have one meeting in August, but that's usually after we've had two in July. And this year, we only had one in July, so we might need two meetings in August. So I'm good with that. I'm good with that. So, okay. Then, uh, did I hear a motion to adjourn? And the second. Oh, <laughs> all right. All in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Chris.